Indonesian crochet can be habit forming and may result in the following. Reduced interest in sleeping, eating, cooking, getting dressed, making the bed, laundry, vacuuming, dusting, taking out the trash, yard work, paying bills, vehicle maintenance, going to the gym, going to work, answering the phone, answering email, grocery shopping, tax preparation, all other forms of fiber artistry. Please consult your local yarn shop staff to determine if Tunisian crochet is right for you and as always please craft responsibly. Tunisian crochet can be pretty hard to set down once you get going on it and I think that's due to the rhythm of the rows, the joy of being free from having to turn your work, and the startlingly different fabric that comes off your hook. If you want to play along today and don't have a Tunisian hook, no worries. I'll be demonstrating initially on one of these. Yep, grandma's old fashioned straight shafted hook. Just make sure you are using yarn one size finer than you would normally use with whatever hook size you decide to practice with. And after you are done here, go check out my Why You Should Try Tunisian episode if you haven't already seen it. I cover the pros and cons of this technique, hook options, patterns, books, and other useful stuff. Okay, let's dive in. I am going to show you guys Tunisian crochet starting on just an old fashioned hook. That way you can try this stitch style out and if you like it then you can go invest in you know tools and so forth. This is a yarn that I would normally use an H or an I hook with and it's very important when you're working Tunisian crochet to work with a hook that's a minimum of one size larger than you would normally use with a given yarn because Tunisian crochet is a very dense stitch. I, in this case, I'm working with a J when with this I'd normally work with an H. So I, since I can be on the tight side, especially when I get going quickly, I've gone up two sizes. Now, even when you're working on a really, really long project, say a blanket or so forth, and the starting chain is really long, you can do your initial starting chain for a Tunisian project with a standard crochet hook of the same size that you're going to work the rest of the project with. Now we're going to chain just a small number of stitches here. We don't need a bunch because one, we don't have a lot of hook length to work with and you need to practice your edges just like in regular crochet. With regular crochet, the vast majority of problems in my experience that are going to happen are going to happen probably at your edges. Tunisian is no different. So here's our nice starting chain. Now, you have been taught, a lot of you, to anchor your first row of stitches here in the top front facing loop of the chain. With Tunisian crochet, and I now do this with almost all my crochet projects. You roll to the back. Have you ever looked at the back of the chain? It looks like interlocking chain links and you can see three strands per stitch instead of just two. So here in the front you see two stitches. Back here you see there's three. With Tunisian crochet you don't anchor here, you anchor in what's called the third loop in the back. So we're going to skip this first one and we're going to go underneath the second one right here. And we're going to pull up a loop. And we're going to leave it. Insert your hook underneath that next third loop in the back, yarn over, and just leave it. The next third loop in a row and leave it. And look, you're starting to see there's that beautiful starting edge. This is definitely the part that feels the strangest. We're so used to as crocheters, we're used to yarning over, drawing up a loop, and then doing something like yarn over and, you know, join it. We're not doing that. We're traveling along and we're loading up loops. This is our first what's called forward pass. 
Now you'll notice my loops can travel across the shaft of the hook. You want your loops loose enough that they can slide fairly readily. Helps keep your fabric from being too tight. But it also just makes it a lot easier to do this technique. Let me do the last couple here. That one. And there's our last one. We have now completed our first what's called forward pass because Tunisian crochet is worked in two halves forward pass and the return pass. You'll know if you've done this right so when you turn and look at your edge look at that beautiful line. Okay step one for our return pass and this is what is considered the typical return pass. There are fancy patterns that have you do something different but unless a, if a pattern does not specify what kind of return pass to do then you're going to assume that this is what you're going to be doing. Chain one and make sure you don't do it too tight make sure it's a little on the loose side. Now here's the fun part. I love this part. I think this is part of why this form of Tunisian is so hard to put down once you get going. Yarn over, draw through two, move your fingers over. Yarn over, draw through two, move your fingers. Yarn over, draw through two, move those fingers. And all the way across until you have only one stitch left on the hook. Ta-da! There's our first row of Tunisian crochet. How different is that? looks nothing like other crochet forms at all, does it? Now funny enough, you see this loop around the hook? That actually counts as our first stitch of the row. This is the only form of crochet where this counts sort of as a stitch. And you notice it lines up right here with the edge. So when you finish your return pass, this starting loop is the beginning stitch of your next row. How fun is that? No turning chain. The closest you have to a turning chain in Tunisian crochet is that chain one you do over here at this side before you begin your return pass. Now let me introduce you to Tunisian Simple Stitch, abbreviated TSS. I frequently do TSS with all sorts of yarns just to see what it's going to look like because it can be so beautiful. I'm going to pass underneath this bar right here. Now you notice I used the word bar. What's interesting is that even the anatomy of Tunisian crochet, crochet stitches is different. You'll see here, right here, this is our front vertical bar and here in the back is the rear vertical bar and these are considered the horizontal bars in between. Tunisian simple stitch has you skipping this first strand because this loop counts as this one stitch and you're passing underneath the front vertical bar of the next stitch. Next stitch here. Front vertical bar. Yarn over and drop a loop. Insert the hook underneath, underneath the next vertical bar. Yarn over and drop a loop. Front vertical bar. Yarn over drop a loop. And you notice I'm doing this little rocking motion. Yarn over, drop a loop. A little rocking motion. It brings you an extra millimeter or two of fabric that allows your stitches, allows the legs to be long enough and it keeps your fabric from being stiff. It is absolutely better in pretty much every single way with Tunisian crochet to be looser rather than tighter. Now, here is secret number one to having an edge that looks like this all the way around your project. You're going to turn and look. Your last stitch of the row does not, the last loop you drop does not pass underneath one vertical bar, it passes underneath both. If you turn and look at the project sideways, you can see there's two loops 
right there. You need to pass underneath both of those. See? And that's where you draw up that last one. There is our forward pass for this row. Now, return pass. Remember, chain one. On this side of the fabric, on the left side of the fabric, you are always making sure to number one, anchor the last stitch of the row underneath both strands of that V pair there, and then you're doing a chain one to begin the rest of the return pass. So now that we've done our chain one, yarn over through two, yarn over through two, oop. If you accidentally go through too many, don't worry, just reverse out and go forward again. And there is our last one. Now look at this interesting effect. I've always loved this. It looks like an open grid work. That's totally normal. But now that we've done that, look what happened to the horizontal bars from the row below. They've almost sunk down into that space of open squares that had been created with that first row. And when we go through and we do the next complete row, these horizontal bars are going to sink down and set down into this open space and create this nice dense mesh that is so pretty to look at. Now, let me show you the secret to getting your starting edge, your right edge, as nice as everything else. I'm going to bring these together and I'm going to show you. Look how these look bigger than over here. If you were to actually measure those side by side, you'd find that this edge is already taller or a little longer than this side. And the deeper you get up into your fabric, the more exaggerated that effect is going to become. My first Tunisian scarf was shaped, this edge was nice, this edge was nice, the edges all looked nice, but this edge swooped. It bubbled out because this edge the edge stitches were all looser than everything else. And I don't remember where I ran across the tip, but if you will get yourself in the habit of doing this right from the get-go, you can eliminate that problem as well. We're going to do our first normal yarn over and draw up a loop under the vertical bars. And we're going to stop right there. Three stitches in. Now watch this. We're going to pull on the second loop. You see how it tightened up that one? And we're going to pull up this one too and just pull out that slack. If you will get yourself in the habit as a young Tunisian crocheter of stopping three or four stitches in and pulling the slack out of two and three, it tightens these up and that gives you a starting edge or a right edge that is the same measurement or the same height as the other side of the project. That way you don't have one edge of your project that's wonky and tall and loose. Now the most common mistake that you'll find people make in the middle of Tunisian fabric is this. Something distracts you and you insert your, you, know, you look away from your project and you look down and you see that there is a loop around the hook and so you don't do anything with it and you move on, you do the next one. You didn't actually yarn over and draw up a loop. And you can see when you look, see the pull that's happening there? And see how much taller that is than the rest? That means you did not draw up a loop. You inserted the hook under that vertical bar, which you didn't yarn over and draw up a loop like this. But again, this is crochet, so you just rip back to the point where you made the mistake, you fix it, and you go on with your day. Unlike knit, you don't have to worry about stitches running away from you. Now, again, if you have to turn the work sideways so you can see the partner strand that goes with this front vertical loop, because here's the front, 
if you pull on it, the one it's attached to, the other one you're supposed to pass under, will move. The more rows you go up into a project, you'll know if you're getting that in the right place because you start getting this beautiful line of V's down this edge, the same as the beautiful line of V's you have on your starting edge, and the line of V's on this edge. That will be the same size as everything else if you stop and pull out your slack. So say it with me. Beginning of our return pass starts with a yep, chain one. Then the fun part, yarn over through two, yarn over through two, yarn over through two. Okay, let me show you the tightening of the right edge one more time. Yarn over and drop a loop. Pass underneath that front vertical bar, yarn over and drop that loop, that little rocking motion that brings that little extra through with you. You don't really need to worry about doing that here at the beginning of the row because you already have a problem with these stitches being a little too big if you don't stop and pull out your slack. Now the entire rest of the row, do that little rocking motion because we tend to start getting going really fast and you're rip roaring through these rows and if you don't get in the habit of doing that little rocking motion and bring some extra through, you're going to find that your fabric is a little strange. You'll find that it's loosen, looser and softer here at all the edges, but it can get tight, dense, and a little curly here in the middle of the row. That's because you're not taking time to draw up a tall enough loop underneath these vertical bars here in the middle of the fabric. Okay front vertical bar, weeding its partner back here. Both of those. And chain one, and our return pass. Now if you're going to change colors, this is where you do that, typically. This last yarn over and drop a loop to finish a return pass on a row is where you do your color change. Now let's say that this is a square that you have completed making. You're making a bunch of squares that you're going to seam together into a quilt, a, a pillow, a scarf, just something fun, a sampler. How do you finish this top row? There's all sorts of ways you can do that. My favorite is just to simply switch back over to the same size. If you were working with a long hook, switch back over to standard crochet hook and anchoring in the same place as usual, drop a loop, but then up oh, single crochet. Some of the things I love about Tunisian crochet is that many of the stitches or skills that you already have for standard crochet stitches, translate over to Tunisian. It's a great way to finish off your edge. You could also do a slip stitch along here as well. If you do that, make sure you do the slip stitches on the big, soft, and loose side because slip stitches already have a tendency to be tight and you want to make sure that you don't make the top edge of your project pucker. There's underneath our two edge stitches, and there it is. It's complete. Isn't that pretty? Line of V's, line of V's, line of V's, and the same on this side. Unlike standard crochet, where maybe your top edge and your bottom edge look okay, they might might look nice, but your edges on the sides tend to look awful. Oh, look, gorgeous all the way around. 
Love it, love it. Now you notice, look at this. See how it's rolling in? It's tucking in like that. If you have that happening, you aren't doing anything wrong. Look at the back of the fabric. It almost looks like garter stitch from knit, right? Some brilliant person out there figured out that if you were to take a razor blade and slice the fabric this way into two halves, there's up to 30% more material here on the back half than on the front half. All that extra material back there is, it's got to go somewhere. And so it's putting pressure. It's exerting pressure and that's making the fabric roll inwards towards itself. If you want to learn about ways to combat that, if you're making things on your own with Tunisian, be sure you go check out my Why You Should Try Tunisian Crochet episode, the companion episode to this one where I, I talk about all sorts of other things Tunisian related. But that roll is normal. Now, let me show you what happens if you're working with something too tight. If you're working with a hook too small. This is the diameter of hook that I would work this yarn with if I was working regular crochet. But I'm doing Tunisian with it. Look how tight those stitches are and look how bad this is to roll. If you could reach through the screen and fill this, this is very dense fabric, but it is so tight and it, it is so stiff. And the roll and the curl is so much more exaggerated. It's so much worse when your stitches are too tight. Hopefully this definitely helps drive home that with Tunisian, looser is better and go up to as large a hook as you need to, to get a soft pliable fabric that even if it rolls a little bit, or even if it rolls some, it's not curling up on you like jelly roll like this. I mean, I'm, I have to sit here and force it open or just boop. Too tight, too tight, too tight. Okay, let's see what Tunisian looks like on a long hook. It's great to be able to give Tunisian a try with just standard old fashioned hook that a lot of people have laying around. But now let's see the big long hooks in action. This is a 10 inch. Something that's been living in my collection for a while. And it's the same size as the standard hook I was using earlier. As you can see, slide is really important. That's why I really love metal when I can work with it. If I need something much longer, either a metal hook on a cable, talk about those in the other episode, or a nice smooth finished wood so you get this great glide. But if your stitches are so tight, if your loops are so tight that you cannot easily slide, you need to loosen up. I promise you'll like your fabric better and your hands will appreciate you very much. It's a different rhythm to get used to. As you can see, you can get to where you can go fairly quickly. Get my stupid cable out of the way there. In the past, blankets made by with Tunisian were made in strips, and you were limited to however many stitches you could cram onto a long hook. Now you can see the way these are compressing up. You could get quite a few stitches even on a 10 inch hook, but you were still limited by the length of your tool. Living in the modern day and having access to hooks on cables is great. Now this is again the standard return pass that I demonstrated for you earlier. And if you're wondering where fancy stitch patterns come in, that is when you start getting into non-standard forward passes. They start having you do drawing up multiple loops and in stitches, changing where those loops are drawn up. They're having you do non-standard return passes where you're doing yarn over through three or yarn over through four, or yarn over even through seven together to do all sorts of interesting shapes no different than what I showed you on the smaller crochet hook earlier. It's just a lot more stitches because we have a lot more real estate on our hook to work with. Now, 
this isn't much to hold on to. As you notice, there's a lot of fiddling with my fingers to kind of control and move the loops across this hook. There is a way to create a more ergonomic handled hook than this. This is my poor grungy old ergonomic crochet handle. I've been using this for so many years, it's absorbed so much skin oil, it's kind of ratty looking. But this is a double-ended crochet hook in here, the double-ended Tunisian hook. fitted into one of these handles. Now I am not the person who figured this out. Some other brilliant person years ago figured out that you could do this and this lets you make an ergonomic handled Tunisian hook. And this is really comfortable to work with. A big silver Tunisian shawl that I made, a stole, this is the exact combination that I used to make that. It almost, uh, it almost looks like a short rapier here, doesn't it? But it's substantially more comfortable on the hands. Now, I know some of you struggled uh, more than you expected to just now. Please don't give up. Do not be frustrated with yourself if your hands and your brain had a hard time remembering to leave those loops on that hook. Ironically, the more experience you have had as a crocheter before you try this method, the harder it is to override that old muscle memory. My best advice is to focus on practicing the steps very slowly and give your brain the time it needs to pick this up. That will have you making a gorgeous fabric with fabulous edges like nothing you've ever seen before. I hope adding Tunisian to your crochet repertoire brings some excitement and joy into your yarn life. And I'd love to see pictures or project links to anything you make via email in the comment section or on Instagram. Subscribe to my channel, share it with other yarn fiends in your life, and let me know if there is a crochet or knitting topic you'd like to see a video on in the future. And thanks for spending part of your day here with me at iHeartYarn.